Okay, in this video we're going to construct a confidence interval for a Bernoulli random variable. And recall that a Bernoulli random variable is a discrete random variable that only has two possible values, and those are traditionally encoded as 0 and 1. Um, and then the parameter of the random variable is little p, and little, lowercase p is the probability that the random variable is equal to 1. Okay, so I have a real-life scenario here. A test item is piloted for inclusion in a standardized exam. Of the 487 randomly chosen test takers that are given the item, 305 respond correctly. Produce a 95% confidence interval for P, the probability that a randomly chosen test taker responds to the item correctly, centered at the natural point estimate for P. Okay, so we're going to construct a con confidence interval here, and I'm being a little bit risky because I say that we have a natural <laughs> point estimate for P, but I, I really do think that that's merited. And this is the case, if you wanted to go through the maximum likelihood estimation, you would get this estimate for P. And what is that? Well, we had 487 test takers, and of those 487, 305 responded correctly. So if I want the probability that a randomly chosen test taker responds to the item correctly, then my natural point estimate, just meaning one value, is 305 over 487. It's the experimental probability, or we've called it the relative frequency. Okay, that's my natural point estimate. Now my random variable here, as I said, is Bernoulli, so it has value 0 and 1. And it has value 1 if the item is responded to correctly, and it has value 0 if it's responded to incorrectly. Or I guess not responded to correctly would be a better way to say it, in case people do not respond at all. Okay. And then this little p here, maybe I'll put a little tail on it is the probability that x is equal to 1. Okay. And then you may recall the x bar for a Bernoulli random variable. That's just a little p. That's 305 over 487. Because you take the values times the probabilities, well, the 0 isn't going to contribute anything because you're multiplying with 0 by something and then the, you just have the 1 times the probability that x equals 1. So this is the expectation and if I have 487 observations then I'm going to write those as 487 random variables. And what we're doing here is estimating the mean, right? Because x bar, um, or excuse me, mu is equal to the actual value for p. I should have been putting a subscript of e because these are estimates for little p. Okay, so we're trying to estimate the mean, and we're going to use the sample mean, which is what we have here. That's the sample mean at which to center our confidence interval. Um, but because we're doing a confidence interval, we're not just going to estimate with one value. We're actually going to give an interval of values. And I think I said according to a 95%. Yes, a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so if I have 487 observations, that almost surely will qualify for the central limit theorem, so long as those observations are independent. You know, if people aren't, like, discussing their answers with each other, that would be something that would violate the independent assumption. But if we are independent and identically distributed, then the sample mean, according to the central limit theorem, is going to have the same mean as the underlying distribution, so that's p. And what's the standard deviation? Well, it's the standard deviation of the underlying distribution divided by the square root of n, in this case the square root of 487. And that's what the central limit theorem tells us. Now, there's a problem here. 
um, not only do we need to estimate this x bar, we need to s or excuse me, we need to estimate mu via x bar. We need to estimate the standard deviation. Okay, so sigma is unknown. Implies we need to calculate s. And um, as I said in the previous section, from now on in the course, whenever you see s, unless it's otherwise denoted, you're dividing by n minus 1. We're using the unbiased variance. Okay, so s squared, we take 1 over n minus 1 um, times the sum of the squared deviations from the mean. So I have xi minus, let's see, the mean, the sample mean here is 305 over 487 squared. Okay, so what's that look like? It's 1 over 486 times, well, xi can only have two values. It can have value 1 or value 0. And we see that 305 respond correctly. So it has value 1 305 times, and it has value 0, let's see, if you subtract, you get 182 times. So we have 100, whoops, let's do that, 182 Right, that's how many of these terms are going to be 0 for xi, and then we'll have 0 minus 305 over 487 squared plus 305 of the terms are going to be 1. Okay, so you, this is using the fact that multiplication can be seen as re repeated addition. Okay, so I'm adding up 487 of these terms, 182 of them look like this, and the other 305 look like this. Okay, well that is just an arithmetic calculation. It's a rather complicated one, but that's what it is. You end up with 27,755 over um, 118,341 which comes out to about 0.2345. I'll let you check that on the calculator on your own. Okay, so that's my estimate for s squared, the variance. That's an unbiased estimate since we divided by n minus 1. So now I'm going to take the square root to get an estimate for the standard deviation. So s, I should, yeah, because it's an s, we know that it's an estimate here. Um, s is equal to the square root of, well, let's do it exactly, 227,755 over 118,341, which is approximately the square root of 0.2345, which is approximately uh, 0.4843. Okay, so that's our estimate for the standard deviation. That's our estimate for the standard deviation. So I'm just going to rewrite my distribution here. When I have this distribution, we're going to plug in that estimate for the standard deviation here. And we have the x bar is approximately normally distributed with mean p, right, that's what we're trying to estimate overall, and standard deviation about 0.4843 divided by the square root of 487. All right, written in a decimal that we can work with. This is about normally distributed with mean p and standard deviation 0.0219. Okay, now we're gonna think of x bar as a random variable. I'm gonna to need to extend my page here. So if x bar is normally distributed, then I can draw a normal, or a bell curve for it. So I'll draw my bell curve here. And the normal distribution is centered at P. Now I'm going to be talking about z scores, so that's where z is equal to zero. 
This is a 95% confidence interval. Okay. So what we're going to do is work with whatever z values out here. Give this area to be to be no larger than 0.95 where how far does it go out? It goes out to the absolute value of z sub 305 over 487. I'm going to finish drawing this picture and then I'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> negative absolute yeah, negative absolute value is z 305 over 487. Okay, so the x bar that we saw, that we observed, was 305 over 487. Okay. And the 95% confidence interval is the interval of values for the mean, okay, the interval of estimates for the mean, under which the probability that we get no, more, no further from that mean than what we saw, okay, is no larger than 95%. So we're measuring how far away. Let's suppose that, you know, p were equal to 0.5 maybe. Okay. Under that situation, how far away is the actual sample mean that we observed in terms of standard deviations? That's why we do the z score. Okay. So we want to choose all the p values. This actually ends up not being one of them. We want to choose all the p values for which this area is no larger than 0.95. Okay, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Well, to get the area, how would we calculate that? We would look up the absolute value of the z-score of 305 over 487. Now I can't actually compute that z-score right now, and I actually never can, because I don't know what p is. I only have an esti a point estimate for p, which is 305 over 487. Okay. So we're going to have to go backwards. I'm gonna, I, I would look up that z-score, and that would give me a value a. Now that value a would be a little bit too big. Okay. This shaded region would be less than the value A, and that is because when I look up um, this, this z-score here with an absolute value, that's going to give me this area plus the extra area over here. Well, I need to subtract the area over here. That area over there is going to be 1 minus A, right? Because it's the same as the area over here, and the total area gives you 1. So we want that A... So we want that a minus 1 minus a is no larger than 95%, 0 0.95. Okay. Well, that gives us that 2a minus 1 is no larger than 0 0.95, which tells us 2a is no larger than 1.95. So we divide both sides by 2, and we get that a needs to be less than or equal to 0.975. So if A is less than or equal to 0.975, let's pull up, remember that's what we got from the normal distribution table when we looked up this non-negative z-score. Um, let's see, if we get that our area in here is no larger than 0.975, right here's 0.975, whoops, I'll stop that. And let's see, we're at 1.9, and then if I go up, I'm at 0 0.06. So we're at 1.96, and that actually ends up being a z-score that's um, very commonly used because of the 95% confidence level is very commonly used. So we get that the absolute value of this z-score of 305 over 487 okay, is no larger than 1.96. Okay, remember our goal here is to estimate P. That's why I already have like four underlines on it. Our goal is to estimate P. So, now I'm going to write this z-score out, how it's computated. If I take the absolute value of the z-score, that's the absolute value of my observation, which is 305 over 487, that's my observed sample mean, minus the actual mean, of the normal distribution divided by the standard deviation. Let's remember what that standard deviation was. Where'd it go? There it is, 0 0.0219. 
and let's see, 219. And I want that that's less than or equal to 1.96. So we have some algebra to do here. And I have that negative 1.96 is less than or equal to 305 over 487 minus P over 0 0.0219, which is less than or equal to positive 1.96. Okay, you multiply by the 0 0.0219, and we get that 305 over 487 minus P is less than or equal to, that ends up giving us 0 0.0429. Okay, and over here it'll be negative. Okay, so now I can subtract, um, I can subtract 305 over 487 from all, each portion of the inequality. Okay, and if you plug those into a, um, a calculator, you'll get that we have negative 0.7539 is less than or equal to negative P, which is less than or equal to 0.5834. And this, uh, this one's going to be negative. This one's negative. Okay, now I'm going to multiply through by negative 1 so that I have P and not minus P. Now when you multiply an inequality by negative, you have to switch the order of the inequality. So we have that P is between 0.7539 and 0.5834. Okay, so this gives us our confidence interval for P. And remember that what that means is that is the interval of p-values under which this area is no greater than 0.95, under which the probability that we would get a, a sample mean no more extreme than 305 over 487 is no greater than 0.95. Because if that probability was like 0.99 or 99.9% that we would get a, get a sample mean no larger than this, that means that this, or no smaller than that, more extreme is what I mean by um, no further away from the p-value, then that would mean that this is a pretty extreme sample mean based on that p-value, and the p-value really seems like it's far off and doesn't make sense. Okay, so here is my 95% confidence interval. And of course you could put it as um, traditional interval notation. I don't really care. All I care is that you're working with the theory behind the confidence interval and that you understand how it works and how to get it. Okay, great. See you in the next video.